Welcome everyone. Welcome to our audience members and welcome to our panelists. It's wonderful that you could join us. My name is Basima Sizemore and I'm a researcher at the Other and Belonging Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. And I have the great pleasure of moderating today's event titled Understanding Islamophobia in the Global Context, which will be a facilitated conversation on how to challenge discourses and actions that discriminate against Muslims. So this event marks the release of two new reading resource packs on annotated bibliographies that examine Islamophobia from a global perspective. And notably, these reading resource packs are the culmination of several years of research into the phenomenon of Islamophobia in Europe and the Asia Pacific region. Today in conversation with the authors, we will unpack and contextualize Islamophobia in in Asia Pacific Reading Resource Pack authored by El Sadiq El Sheikh and Rhonda Aitawi, and the Islamophobia in Europe Reading Resource Pack authored by El Sadiq El Sheikh, Fareed Hafiz, and Linda Hayuki. This is the third reading resource pack that we have produced at the Othering and Belonging Institute, the first of which was a 2018 publication, which is a compilation of academic research, including peer reviewed journal articles and books that examines Islamophobia in the context of the United States. Both al Sadiq al-Sheikh and Dr. Rhonda Aitawi were the authors for that publication. And so the annotated bibliographies that we're going to be engaging with today is part of a larger body of work conducted by the Global Justice Program at the Othering and Belonging Institute to document and counter the structural and root causes of Islamophobia. Our Islamophobia project at the Other and Belonging Institute aims to provide cutting edge research and tools for narrative production, awareness raising, community engagement, and policy interventions to understand and challenge the social, political, and legal mechanisms used to demonize and other Muslims in the United States and globally. And so our projects within this area of work range from consolidating scholarly investigations and research on Islamophobia into reading resource packs to documenting the legalized othering of Muslims by way of US federal and state policies, as well as to survey instruments, as well as to use survey instruments to engage the Muslim American community to assess how Islamophobia has directly impacted Muslim Americans. Our time together today will focus on how the last two decades we have witnessed increased Islamophobic attacks against Muslims in non-Muslim majority countries in nearly every corner of the globe. Such attacks appeared in discriminatory laws, administrative policy, judicial activities, and public actions of state officials and private citizens that single out Muslims and Islam. In response to this phenomenon, we have developed these reading resource packs to understand the origins, motivations, and underlying power structures that generate and support global Islamophobia. On that note, I welcome everyone to this rich discussion and the authors and panelists who I will now introduce will engage in conversation on how to challenge global discourses and actions that discriminate against Muslims and how to ultimately foster a world of belonging. I'll first introduce El Sadiq El Sheikh, joining us from Berkeley, California, who is the director of the Global Justice Program at the Othering and Belonging Institute. El Sadiq's research focuses on global north, global south inequity as it relates to socio-political dynamics nation state and citizenship, and structural mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rhonda Aitawi, joining from Sydney, Australia, who is a former research fellow with the Othering and Belonging Institute, working with the Global Justice Program to produce research on Islamophobia and the exclusion of Muslims in the West. She is currently the director of the Center for Western Sydney at Western Sydney University, Australia. Her research examines geographies of diversity, multiculturalism, and belonging in urban spaces, and advocates for place-based approaches to policymaking. Rhonda has a PhD in first-class honors in social sciences, otherwise known as human geography, from Western Sydney University. I'd now like to welcome Dr. Fried Hoffes, joining from Williamstown, Massachusetts, who is currently the Distinguished Visiting Professor of International Studies at Williams College, Massachusetts. Since 2017, he is also a non-resident researcher at Georgetown University's The Bridge Initiative. He is the co-founding editor of the European Islamophobia Report 
and his research focuses on anti-Muslim racism, the far right, and decoloniality. I'd like to wrap us up in introductions by giving a warm welcome to Dr. Linda Yaki, joining from Sarajevo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, who works as a freelance consultant for research and policy work in national and transnational projects related to Muslim minorities in Europe, anti-Muslim racism and non-discrimination. She is also the coordinator of the working group Anti-Muslim Racism at the European Coalition of Cities Against Racism. She has previously worked as a research associate with the Center for Islam and Global Affairs as a project officer with the Islamic Cooperation Youth Forum. I extend a warm welcome to all of you, our panelists. It's a pleasure to have you here with us and thank you for being available to engage in this conversation and to speak to your insight and contributions to this important work. Before we begin, I want to briefly mention that this event will run for 90 minutes ending at 2.30 Pacific Standard Time. And I invite our audience members to share any questions you have for the panelists in the chat box. And we'll be monitoring and collecting those questions to share with the authors at the end of the event where we'll have roughly 20 minutes for Q&A. So we look forward to receiving your questions. With that, I welcome the panelists to share their opening remarks to this discussion. And I'd like to invite Dr. Rhonda Itawi to start us off. The floor is yours. Thank you, Basima. Thank you for your warm welcome. And thank you to the Othering and Belonging Institute for hosting this event. Um, as Basima has introduced me, I uh, am currently working at the Centre for Western Sydney at Western Sydney University. I did have the great pleasure to work at the Othering and Belonging Institute as a research fellow for around a year and a half, I believe, if, I can, if I've calculated correctly. Uh, so my involvement in, uh, the, in the reading pack that I'll cover today for the Asia Pacific kind of came as a sequel to the, other, the annotated bibliography that I worked on for uh, the United States with Sadiq El Sheikh, who's on this, uh, he's in a, on this panel. And we were really interested in documenting the scholarly works on Islamophobia and creating a more accessible kind of shorthand resource that practitioners, um, you know, teachers, policymakers, or researchers could then utilize in their studies around Islamophobia. And it was quite an exercise trying to figure out how, how to best organize this or um, you know, the, mo the most accessible way we could consolidate such a large body of work. Uh, when it was one country in the United States, I think it was a lot more simple. Uh, but when we did expand this to the Asia Pacific, uh, we had to prioritize the countries that, that we would focus on based on where there was a large body of work being produced, but also trying to bridge the connections between um, quite distinct contexts, but also very connected um, contexts as well, and, and drawing those connections across those, um, those various nations and in, in the ways that Islamophobia manifests. So um, within, within this resource pack, we collected just under 1,500 citations across 10 countries in the, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, and I'll, I'll go through the list and what you can see is some of these nations may have some similar attributes or um, more similar contexts as it relates to Islamophobia, but, but they are quite distinct as well, as I've emphasised. So we covered uh, in alphabetical order, Australia, uh, China, India, Myanmar, New Zealand, Japan, uh, the Philippines, South Korea, Sri Lanka and Thailand. And our publication in looking at these countries tries to provide an overall summary of some of the main themes, some of the main issues and the trends that relate to Islamophobia in each of the listed country. And we do adopt a similar framework to what we had adopted in the 2018 version of the United States Reading Pack, looking thematically at how Islamophobia manifests across these nations according to the scholarly works in this field. But we did have a dual purpose as well in trying to highlight the countries where there may be um, significant issues of Islamophobia, but gaps in the current research and where they might, where, where they may need to be um, some more scholarly attention being paid to the research in, in those respective contexts. 
so we really do try to provide um, this thematically organized work. Uh, it was a very complex, it was a very um, yeah, complex issue to cover across the Asia Pacific. And especially over the last few years, the research became more and more current and, um, and relevant. And unfortunately, in some contexts covered uh, extremely violent um, across the Asia Pacific. So I think this is a really timely piece of work. Uh, it does consolidate quite large, again, just under 1,500 uh, pieces of work across the region. But we do draw, try to draw attention to the connections across the, across the region and across the globe. So within the uh, reading pack, I just want to flag one last thing before I close my opening remarks, is we do have a theme around counter narratives and strategies. So based on the scholarly works, what are the current, uh, what are the current ways that Islamophobia is being challenged in each of those contexts? And what, what you'll find within our reading pack is in, in particular contexts, this has been more developed. However, in some contexts, there, there are very minimal counter narratives and strategies being adopted and uh, clearly a, a key point of action in terms of research, but also practitioners um, trying to, to tackle the issue that it is an area in need in the Asia Pacific, especially as I've said, um, you know, noting that Islamophobia has become quite a violent and, and critical issue to cover in, in the area. I will kind of, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll provide some time for questions and um, and be able to engage a little more deeply in the rest of the themes. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you for setting the stage um, and sharing the thought process behind the research and thought process behind this significant and Herculean, like this giant body of work. Um, very exciting to dig into it deeper. I would like to invite El Sadiq to share some opening remarks as well. Thank you, Basima. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I, I would like just to say a couple of thoughts that I'm really privileged uh, to have been in a work journey with those outstanding, phenomenal scholar and researchers you see on the screen. Just to produce those two uh, uh, annotated bibliographies, uh, on Islamophobia in Asia Pacific and Europe. Uh, it was a very informative uh, for me uh, and pleasant journey, uh, despite uh, unpleasant topic that we are investigating. So uh, thank you, Farid, Randa, Linda, uh, for your wisdom and for your scholarship in this. So, um, let me put my timer because I often go over time. So the, for me, you know, the, the whole endeavor of looking at to consolidate our understanding of Islamophobia, because it seems to me it pops in different places, but we start as researchers to see there is a commonality. There is even the motivation could be different, but it seems uh, the end result or uh, the processes of, 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 of the violent expression of it became uh, so similar despite you know different culture linguistic and, and geographical locations uh, but that also coincide with uh, current just global political climate that reflect new reality influenced by demagoguery and populist political forces that uh, at many times was present at the echelon of power in many countries including ours uh, when we start to dig into Islamophobia. So these forces conspire with the re-emerging of supremacy and Islamationalism ideology, for example, in Europe or uh, the European or white supremacy in many of the Western world, Hindu supremacy in India, Buddhist supremacy in Myanmar, or even you know ideas like national cohesions, as in the case of China. But the list could go on and on. So. Uh, so that being this kind of demagoguery or, uh, or nationalistic uh, uh, nationalism being used and reused as a tool to drive wedge between mainstream society and, and minorities in general or minoritized group, or whether that racial, ethnic or religious group on one hand, and also 
to mask political corruption and to avoid accountability by way of increasing fragmentation, fear-mongering, and xenophobic tendencies in many societies across the globe, on the other hand. We all know that Islamophobia is not a new phenomenon. However, the current political climate that I mentioned of governance collapse led to increased racial, ethnic, and or xenophobic prejudice and animosity to un to unprecedented level and has given rise to weaponized Islamophobia as a proxy to anti-black, anti-migrant, anti-refugee uh, grassroots movements in many countries across the, the globe. Um, as such, uh, Islamophobia emerged and re-emerged in the context of colonial legacy, structural racism, and globalized neoliberal economic relations. Uh, so in that sense, for us, Islamophobia moved away from an individual attitude or act to a more systematic and well-organized phenomena through robust globalized financial networks at, at, at times, uh, whether within national uh, legal or administrative mechanism to discriminate against Muslim uh, in a wider uh, spaces. So as such, global contemporary Islamophobia movements plural, operate with the sheer ambitions to scrutinize and dehumanize, undermine, and other Muslims' citizenry and agency as a form of othering group based on their religious or uh, identities or national origins. And it does so to seek to single out and exploit those minorities in general, including Muslim, of course, as a political scapegoat and utility to mask failed economic and political projects and to function as anti-democratic uh, tendencies as a proxy for racial and anxiety within societies that they experience that. So I, I would like just to close by how we at uh, Othering and Belonging situate this type of work. For, you know, at, at OBI, we long believe that the, the frame of Othering and Belonging provides a critical perspective to examine and remedy the processes of exclusion, marginalization, and structural inequality. And also, uh, the framework will help, up, uh, help us to build a more inclusive and equitable uh, society. So in response to the experience of Muslim community here at home and globally, uh, we sought to counteract all form of discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance and to expose the power structures that generate them. And ultimately, by doing so, we could foster pathways toward a more inclusive world. Additionally, as a part of, uh, uh, as a part of a larger body of our work that exposes and challenges Islamophobia, those annotated bibliographies or reading resource packs identify academic publication that document, critique, provide counter-narrative and suggest even solution to Islamophobia in this two wider region, Asia Pacific and, and Europe. And also uh, sometimes it's beyond because the phenomena and the relationship extend beyond uh, the scholarly work itself. So for me, this work has been undertaken to provide this critical analytical lens in our research advocacy and policy making offered to build uh, the society that we aspire to uh, with equity at the heart of it. And, and in doing so, we seek really to counter all the form of discrimination, xenophobic and related intolerance that I, I mentioned, because it's all of them, uh, even though it seems Islamophobia directed to, uh, toward Muslims, but at, at many times it used as a whip against other uh, minority groups, and especially in the context of new arrivals. Um, so I, I hope that this work would be uh, a good utility to foster the world that we all want to live in. Uh, I'll stop here and we'll come back to our conversation later on. Thank you. Thank you, Sadek. Um, I appreciate how you touched on the larger themes and threads and drivers of Islamophobia that we can see manifest across the world and how Islamophobia is being weaponized to undermine Muslims as well as other vulnerable groups and communities. Looking forward to continuing into, into that conversation.
I now like to invite Dr. Linda Huyaki to um, share some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Basima. Um, so I got involved in this project um, a couple of years ago when I was still a PhD student. And back then when um, I was ask, asked by my um, colleague, Dr. Farid Hafez, if I would like to uh, do the bibliography, annotated bibliography with him, I thought that, yeah, why not? Because actually, as a PhD student back then, I was always um, kind of like, especially in the beginning, I was struggling to find something exactly like this, you know, something similar, some kind of a resource that would have helped me back then to have that first um, entrance into the literature on, on Islamophobia. And I thought that um, it was a very good idea, and I still do think so, because um, throughout the years I have gotten some um, requests. Um, some students, they have always come, come to us um, or come to me um, asking, you know, can you direct me to this or that, uh, you know, uh, readings? And, you know, I'm trying to figure out my MA thesis, my seminar paper. I don't have any literature. And um, I was just hoping that our reading research pack would have been already <laughs> done. But uh, thank God now it is. And I'm very happy that we will be able to share it. Um, and especially also, I'm happy to um, have Dr. Rhonda uh, today with us um, talking about the Asia-Pacific uh, context as well, because oftentimes I am involved in conversations on Islamophobia in Europe, and somehow we always try to, or we, we tend to kind of imagine that Islamophobia is all just a problem of the West, so to say, you know. So I really think that this is very helpful, um, you know, balancing out the conversation um, and showing that Islamophobia indeed manifests itself um, around the globe, though in different um, variations, of course. Um, and um, just like El Sadiq mentioned, um, in the European context as well, Islamophobia is not um, just about people's personal um, perceptions or opinions or prejudices or this this sort of a thing. Um, it also has this structural aspect. And I think that um, in the reading resource pack on Europe, we do have lots of literature listed and annotated also, um, which kind of like go into the, they do go into the Muslim um, citizens and those perceived as Muslim um, everyday experiences on Islamophobia. But definitely also it tackles the structural aspect. And I think that it's very important um, that this is being addressed because um, now more and more uh, measures are kind of, um, you know, brought up um, to push Muslims away from from the um, civic space, um, you know, sending them the message that, you know, you do not belong. So <laughs> if, um, you know, the Othering and Belonging Institute is publishing this reading resource back then, I think that it's very fitting because I think fundamentally speaking, it is about belonging, you know, when we're talking about Islamophobia and other forms of racism. Um, and it is indeed something that um, we... I think we, in our um, compilation of, of the um, literature that we selected, we tried to be fair um, to the different national contexts. Of course, we couldn't um, include um, publications in other languages than English, but we tried to kind of like, you know, cover Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, just to show that it, it does also within the European context vary. Um, but at the same time, um, there are there is this issue of um, European level institutional Islamophobia, and um, that is of course something that is uh, largely connected to political big big political conversations. I mean, it goes so far now in our context that campaign materials that have been produced in workshops on capacity building for civil society to tackle hate speech, um, they have been censored uh, from pub publication because they, um, they, are, they contain the hijab or they are addressing Muslim women's um, freedom to choose. 
either to wear or not to wear the hijab. And these kind of materials have been now censored um, from, from publication by the European Union itself. So, um, yes, um, in Europe, the, the situation is very interesting, and I'm sure that we will be coming back to more in depth into that um, throughout this um, event. So that was my opening remark from my side, and I'm sure that my colleague will have much more to say. Thank you, Dr. Hayaki. Um, and I appreciated your points of balancing out the conversation and looking into Islamophobia beyond the Western context and expanding our understanding of Islamophobia beyond Europe and the United States. So thank you for, for all of your contributions to this, to this work, this amazing product that we have here. And next, I'd like to invite Dr. Fadid Hafiz to uh, share some opening remarks. All right, thank you everybody, and especially the Othering and Belonging Institute team that is behind and was behind um, um, this project from the beginning on, and especially in the last phases uh, in terms of the layout and everything that was done by people who are unknown to me. So my, my gratitude and my, my, my thank goes to everybody who was involved in this project. Um, I can only second was what Linda just said in terms of how important I think this uh, uh, reading resource package is um, because it gives an orientation for a lot of um, a lot of students, a lot of people outside maybe also of academia who are interested in that field. And I would say um, there is one aspect I think that is especially crucial, like um, you know one thing to to remind us all of. Uh, we all remember that this year, uh, the United Nations during the General Assembly has um, <clears throat> has introduced the International Day to Combat Islamophobia for 15th of March, right? Um, but there was, and uh, some of you might know that there were two countries that were two countries and one institution without voting right that were kind of questioning this whole day, and those were India, France, and the one without voting right was the European Union. Now we have here an Islamophobia uh, a reading package on Europe dedicated to uh, how Islamophobia is working in Europe. And the political background at which this is uh, uh, at the backdrop of what this is happening is that there are stakeholders, there are power circles that, that do basically not want to recognize still in the year 2023 and who are kind of ridiculing uh, the idea that Islamophobia is a major problem. We have also we see that also in an institutionalized form, right? We have the EU coordinator against anti-Muslim hatred and discrimination, um, basically um, not trying to tackle Islamophobia as a structural thing. So there, uh, I think there, uh, even beyond the academic uh, uh, endeavor that we have uh, undertook here, there is a, an important political dimension to this whole project. So I'm, I'm very grateful uh, that OIB embraced uh, this idea and continued to work on, on that beyond the United States, uh, expanding it not only to Europe, but also Asia and the Pacific. Now, um, one of the things that I would also like to remind us of is if we go back into the more near future, we see that Islamophobia as a terminology actually uh, um, so it has a longer history, but the, the current use of the word um, originated from Britain, right? So it was a very, um, at the beginning, a very European-focused discussion uh, coming from the United Kingdom. Um, and I remember that the, I, I had a good colleague back in Austria in Innsbruck, Armin Muftich, who did in 2016, did an international bibliography on Islamophobia, uh, that includes one th uh, back then included 1,100 titles alone, right? Which is a, which is huge, and I think the fact that we have been able now to you know give some orientation in terms of this annotated bi bibliography is really helpful for a lot of people. So um, one of the things that I would like you know to touch upon here is also the idea of you know what what is Islamophobia in the first place. Um, everybody who who has uh, ditched into this uh, whole theme knows that Islamophobia has there are different connotations and different scholarly works and people and authors do understand Islamophobia also in different ways when they use it 
And, and I think the one of the interesting aspects here is obviously the uh, Runnymede Trust's original use in 1997 was very much coined by this idea of prejudice studies, right? So there is this idea of Islam and Muslim being an ontological category. And, uh, you know, looking at Islamophobia as a form of prejudice may basically saying that this is something that determines interpersonal relationships. So it was less about the structural, more about the personal. And one of the themes that you can uh, often hear in this context was that this is an, an issue of minority majority, right? So Islamophobia basically is regarded as an expression of so mentalities and actions, a form of prejudice, an approach which is coming uh, from social psychology and attempts to explain basically prejudices as the result of uh, social psychological behavior patterns, right? So the focus is indeed individual patterns of thought and individual patterns of action. And we can see very clearly that at the beginning of the emergence of the discussion of Islamophobia, uh, this, was, um, this was a very dominant uh, form of the discussion. While in, there was an article that was written in 2010 by Brian Klug, um, Oxford uh, University professor and a good colleague who was arguing that um, Islamophobia came of its age. It has become something that, you know, um, has become a subfield of, of, of studies. And more important, what, what he was also hinting towards was the... Um, a different way of approaching the question of Islamophobia. And this is what I would call, you know, the whole racism studies informed approach to understanding Islamophobia, which was that Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism is not only a prejudice, uh, something psychological, but a form of cultural racism in which religion is culturalized and transformed into the essential components of cultural conceptions of self and other, which is, and this is the most important aspect, it is about the hegemonic and the dominant discourse which serves the stabilization of power structures. So some, some authors also then started, you know, synthesizing the individual and the structural to include um, various dimensions here. Um, and I think these are really the two dominant uh, literatures that you find in academia. Obviously, the European Union alone depending on how, how you count it, and uh, has at least 24 official languages, right? So one of the questions we were, uh, we were discussing at the beginning was like, you know, how do we want to structure this? Do we want to do it e uh, similar to how Rhonda and El Sadiq did the Asia piece, um, you know, looking at countries? Um, and we decided not to do that, but to follow the, the, the structure, which was also, um, which you guys had used uh, already, um, for the American piece. Um, and on the one hand, because we have like the European Islamophobia report, right, right, which has been, which is like an annual publication that anyway looks at all these European countries. Um, but also um, what we, one, one of the themes that we added, which was not there in the American piece was anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And I think that, and this is my, my uh, you know, the last aspect I'm going to touch upon here. I think this is really important because not only because anti-Semitism is obviously the prevalent form of racism that has haunted the European memory up until today, uh, since the end of, of the Nazi regime. But it is also something that is very um, unconvenient for European debates, right? Nobody really wants to bring, the, have this conversation of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism because it brings the past into the present, right? It, re, it reminds us of patterns that existed in the past that they are reoccurring in the present. So it is something that uh, we have in, in, in the scholarship. We have that. A lot of folks have been writing about that, academics. Uh, and even uh, more interestingly, you know, at the very beginning, some, some reports that were drafted by European Union institutions. But it is something that is more and more suppressed because, um, again, it is something um, that implies the possibility of history to repeat itself, right? And therefore having the Holocaust especially in mind and often reducing the anti-Semitism to the Holocaust alone, while anti-Semitism is a 2,000-year-old history in Europe, this is something, I think, another conversation that we have to have. 
All right. I'm, I see the sun is <laughs> overtaking my picture. I'm going to fix this. But this is already everything that I wanted to say for the entry statement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hafez. Um, and thank you for your comments and, and naming the significance and necessity of this work and the interventions we, we can make. So thank you all for your opening remarks. Um, I'm going to transition us now to talk more specifically about the importance of doing this work to develop a greater understanding of Islamophobia and how to challenge Islamophobia, as well as to discuss the key takeaways from this body of research and what is intersecting and influencing the proliferation of Islamophobia in different regions of the world. So let's start with the work of the Asia Pacific Reading Resource Pack. And my first question is for Dr. Aitawi. And my question is, what are the key themes or attributes of Islamophobia in the Asia Pacific region that you've identified based on your work in this reading resource pack? And how is it distinct or similar to other regional contexts? Thank you, Basima. Uh, thank you for the question. And thank you for everyone who's called in today. It was, it was really great to hear also the opening remarks of my colleagues and um, you know reflecting on the European context. Within the Asia Pacific context, again, um, as Sadiq also pointed out, we are actually over over fifteen hundred citations, not just under. So uh, it's it, it's quite an exercise to try to consolidate this, but I'll try my absolute best in terms of the complexity. Um, within their reading pack, as I listed uh, earlier, we did cover quite unique contexts within the region that included countries like Australia and New Zealand, but then also countries like China, Myanmar, Japan, uh, looking at Thailand, India. So the diversity across, um, you know, across those countries, of course, would produce very different forms of Islamophobia in, in some instances. And as I said earlier, um, some, some quite similar manifestations as well. So what I would say is um, reflecting on the reading pack and you know uh, all the work across these different countries is there was probably three key kind of forms of Islamophobia um, overall. And then I'll dive a little deeper into how some of these sub themes also are organized within the reading pack. So broadly, um, there were some similarities in the types of Islamophobia and how and how that manifested in the more kind of Western contexts, such as Australia and New Zealand. So some of the key themes and um, issues within those contexts were around issues of hyper securitization, really um, the influence of the war on terror and how that manifested and really shaped Islamophobia within those two contexts, um, kind of importing the US brand, I'd say, of Islamophobia within, within those two um, contexts. And within that, the ways in which xenophobia and uh, exclusion from you know, official, official uh, policies of multiculturalism in those countries became um, quite undermined by uh, Islamophobia. So the forms, so how this manifested um, you know, institutionally and at an individual level were quite subtle but very harmful forms of Islamophobia uh, that you know, resulted in you know, individual cases of Islamophobia and violence towards Muslim communities in, in both countries um, and then kind of bubbled up to a very momentous and uh, kind of key event that's, that's somewhat shifted what Islamophobia looks like in both uh, Australia and New Zealand and that was the Christchurch attacks that took place in New Zealand. Um, it was that those attacks in particular really connect the two contexts of Australia and New Zealand, because the perpetrator of those attacks was an was an Australian who, who you know, in being unable to acquire uh, the weapons used in those attacks in Australia, carried out the attacks in in New Zealand where uh, where gun laws weren't as heavily regulated. So it's it's quite interesting um, to firstly see those connections across the two contexts. But um, overall, even prior to these attacks, some of the features that were documented in the scholarly works really brought attention to those similarities. Um, so in terms of the other contexts, I'll then shift over to a key theme that, uh, that, that has really manifested across some, um, some contexts such as China, India, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka is 
this issue around rising ethno-nationalism and ethno-religious conflict in these in these key contexts. So what this has resulted in in key, you know, key contexts again like Myanmar and, and in India are uh, really violent and deadly forms of Islamophobia uh, where Muslims are facing increasing violent persecution and this is only um, intensifying over the last few years. And then I'd say the third kind of key trend that was observed within these scholarly works was around a very un a uniquely Asian politicised version of Islamophobia in contexts like South Korea and Japan um, and Thailand. So these forms of Islamophobia were really heavily relied on um, some of the historical context within these within these nations around um, the Muslim presence that really predate um, some of the more kind of um, the, 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 the more um, critical context of, of Western nations. So within the reading packs, what we do highlight as one of the key themes is, uh, is the way in which it's really essential to ground our discussions uh, of Islamophobia in the Asia Pacific around the history and the, and the context of each country. Uh, and the way that the prejudice is really shaped by each nation's unique history of Islam, the colonial encounters, across those contexts, and then the internal religious dynamics that emerge from, from those contexts. And, and that, that, again, is very distinct from contexts like, like settler colonial nations like Australia and New Zealand, where the Muslim presence is a, a much more recent phenomena and, um, and therefore more heavily influenced by the global war on terror. So I, I don't want to go on for too long, but I do want to quickly just dive into some of the key themes that we captured in the reading pack and just give you a very brief summary of what these key attributes look like in uh, in each of the contexts. So we, we uh, thematically organised all of the countries according to the scaffolding and the framework we had used in our US version of the annotated bibliography. So we really look at... Um, you know, theorizing the field. And this again is looking at uniquely within each context, how are scholars theorizing Islamophobia and what are the key attributes? So we um, really cover the complex socio-political histories in each of the in each of these nations, and then also how global influences converge with those unique histories to to produce um, kind of the, the modern forms of Islamophobia that we're witnessing in each of these countries. We then also cover um, a key theme that we title national security and foreign policy. So this looks at firstly how the global war on terror might be shaping um, and influencing national security and foreign policy measures in each of the countries, but then also how these forms of, um, of national security policies are, uh, again, uniquely shaped by each of the national contexts. Uh, we also track, I want to quickly just highlight a key, act, a key kind of contradiction, I'd say, that we, that we tracked in some of this work, is how some countries, despite um, having quite institutionalised forms of Islamophobia uh, and also everyday forms against Muslims, there are also foreign policy um, movements within each country to foster more positive relations with Muslim nations. So, for example, um, halal tourism is quite a—it's quite a um, substantial part of Japan's current, uh, current foreign policy um, connections with the Muslim world. And it's a similar, um, as well, a similar kind of dichotomy occurs in China where there's a you know, widespread persecution of the Uyghur population, but then also um, politically the, the nation is potent, trying to leverage its, um, its connections with Muslim countries for economic purposes. So it's quite an interesting kind of theme that we've, that we've seen across some of the key contexts is, is again, this contradiction of um, national security policies that other and... Um, discriminate against Muslims, but then on the flip side, politically um, trying to, to forge connections with the Muslim world, again, for, for economic purposes. 
We then also cover citizenship and national identity, and I'll quickly just um, just a very quick breakdown around some of the key attributes. So we track um, a rise in ultra white wing, na wing nationalism. So similar to the European context in nations like Australia and New Zealand, where white nationalism is excluding Muslims. But then on the flip side, um, across Asia, we also track. Um, more intense forms of ethno-religious conflict that I had just mentioned. And then finally, across other contexts, like in the Philippines and in China, uh, really institutionalised exclusion of Muslims from citizenship. And we see how that manifests across different countries in different ways. Uh, we also cover xen xenophobia and how... Um, xenophobia and Islamophobia intertwine. We see that this particularly um, manifests in Australia, in New Zealand um, and Korea as well. And we cover how this theme manifests across all the different countries. Again, too much to probably cover now. We look at themes across our mainstream and digital media. So really um, two key areas here where across most of the countries, how the media perpetuates and um, intensifies Islamophobia, but then also how digital forms, especially social media, have really perpetuated Islamophobia um, into a widespread violent form across countries like Myanmar, um, Sri Lanka and India, uh, and, and being used to, for, to spread misinformation and, um, and, and really contributing to a really intensified marginalization of Muslims. And finally, how these digital forms, uh, platforms are being used to, to counter Islamophobia and challenge Islamophobia across, Muslim, across Muslims in these countries. We also then look at how othering and discrimination is unique in each of the contexts. And um, again, we see some similarities with, you know, with the global North in contexts like Australia, um, and New Zealand, but then also more unique forms across some of the countries that we've profiled. We also look at the gendered forms of Islamophobia, so especially around uh, the demonization of Muslim men in particular contexts, and interestingly, the import of um, the at love jihad in in India around um, the, this you know this notion that Muslim men. Uh, forcing Muslim women into um, into marriage is being imported into other parts of Asia, like Myanmar and um, and also Korea. So some connections across those are more gendered forms. And then on the flip side, how Muslim women are uh, unfairly targeted because of because of being readily identified across some of these countries. We then also look at how. Um, how Islamophobia is affecting, you know, social mobility across education, across the workplace in, um, and, and the labour market in these different countries. We look at um, geography and public space, so how Islamophobia is affecting the way Muslims are engaging in, in, in different spaces and how um, the spatial politics of Islamophobia makes it difficult for Muslims to establish religious sites across these across these different countries. And then finally, the limited work around counter narratives and strategies. And one of the key, I think, similarities across all these countries is the, the role of the digital space in being able to challenge and, um, and work against and provide counter narratives to Islamophobia in each of these countries and how, um, you know, multi-faith networks um, and education are being used to counter Islamophobia across these contexts. It's um, quite difficult to cover most all of it. That is a brief summary of uh, what I believe is a 170-page document uh, across these contexts. But overall, what I'd like to say is um, in, in interrogating these unique, really interesting contexts is firstly the importance of the historical kind of um, backdrop within each of these countries because it does result in quite a unique form of Islamophobia, especially in the Asia-Pacific because of those deeper historical roots with Islam. And um, however, I don't want to underestimate or undermine the um, really the, the immense impact that the global war on terror has had on, on these contexts as well and therefore the connections that manifest across the, the, the countries.
Thank you so much, Rhonda. Um, and thank you for summarizing that immense amount of research <laughs> into just a, a couple minute summary. So thank you for that. And we'll have more time to engage in Q&A, hopefully, um, to dive further. I would like to invite Sadiq to uh, respond next. And my question for you is, why is this work on Islamophobia important? And what purpose does it serve? Thank you, Basima. Um, I think, uh, let me start by this. I think because of the, th those issues that Rhonda tried to map out for us is, I think that's the reason why Islamophobia, uh, this type of work on Islamophobia is so important because the more and more Islamophobia became weaponized, it tells us something else about those uh, contacts across, across, across the globe, but in particular, let me stick with Asia Pacific. Um, because this kind of, uh, you know, work as an ideological organizing principles, uh, especially when we look at the collapse of governance. But by that, I mean, you know, we can divorce Islamophobia from the rise of neoliberalism project of the 1980s onward, and, and how that, 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 that type of uh, project led to complete collapse of governance across the world. And it's especially suffer in, uh, you can see it manifested widely in the global south. So Islamophobia became handy, uh, very handy. And you could, you could substitute Muslim with any other uh, groups. But since, since what uh, the important key point that Rhonda mentioned that, you know, we cannot forget the imperialistic notion of the war in terror itself, like try to reorganize the whole entire world. So this type of, of, of poor struggle and, and, and global hierarchy and dominance between global north and global south, it, it all fit into this idea of trying to structurally silencing uh, uh, the collective global south or you know the global other. So, so Islamophobia work and very interesting whip in two different directions. You know, uh, we've seen for the first time, surprisingly, in the, in the last year or so, the, the, the openness of China, for example, into the uh, more traditional conservative Muslims, majority countries like Saudi Arabia and others. But at the same time, they uh, hammer and, 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 and persecute the Muslim uh, uh, minorities in their own uh, context. So it's very hard like, to figure out how you understand this without actually see Islamophobia as really weaponizing uh, a couple of things. Maybe also, uh, I, I hope we all as a group we will do one work maybe in the future in Islamophobia in majority Muslim countries and how that actually appears and how it works. Because it became more than just dehumanizing those aspects, but more is saving grace of the failing political and economic project within these nations. So for me, this work is important because, because of that organizations that try to erode citizen rights and also weaken democratic institutions at the same time. Because you, you can't survive, for neoliberalism to survive, two things has to happen simultaneously. Uh, citizen rights has to be uh, eroded, and a democratic institution has to be weakened to the extent that to became just tokenism. And we see that obviously in the European context, in American context, but now uh, in the last, uh, since the beginning of the 21st century, we see it across, uh, traveling across uh, uh, the world. So first, let me say just three ways in which I see Islamophobia weaponized to erode democracy. First, um, I hope the time will help me here, but uh, I will go very quickly to stick to five minutes. Uh, so, first, we see that administrative policy, uh, judicial activities, and discriminatory laws that are now became, uh, it seems natural in their face, like if you take the case of India, like the, the, the Citizenship Act. Uh, for example, or you know, the argument of the Chinese government that to say we want to bring about the, 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 the social cohesion of, of the country, uh, or in, in case of Sri Lanka, like to fight you know uh, terrorism, or in the case of the Philippines, to say something very similar that to create more autonomous uh, area for Muslims, which is 
at the face of it, you say, this is, sounds like all uh, nice and dandy, but at the end of the day, there is one particular group being targeted with the dose. So, so it became very easy for, for most of those lawmakers to target just Muslim uh, populations and minority group uh, and to try to push for legislation rather than actually tackling uh, the collapse of the governance itself, their, their political economic projects. And, and, and I, I, I can I can not to mention United States here, United States also, we should, we should be considered United States as a part of the Pacific as well, is, is the leadership of United States doing that in, in a legal framework, like how the proliferation of anti-Sharia, for example, legislation in the United States have nothing to do with anything actually what is being uh, 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 discussed, but it gives a very nice way to escape responsibility. And that's what I mean by political corruption and collapse of governance. So allow those lawmakers and legislators actually to, to, to wash their hand from their uh, responsibility of providing to the citizen across the board, even non-Muslim citizens. So it's easy to pick up a fight that you assume is much easier and you can, uh, you can distract the public and you engage in, in uh, uh, non-meaningful work. So if it that led to uh, uh, violent attack against Muslim, let be, you know, because the othering process that, that they already inquire, it, it helps them in that way. But this not to undermine that there is a concerted organized effort at the bottom, pushing for, for what we see at the top. So, so it worked like a cordium for both sides, from, from you know, the administrative side, uh, 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 legislative side, into a, a, a weaponized a grassroots political movement that in, in, in uh, uh, been uh, taken hostage by the right wing. So when that all happened at this time of the vacuum of political project is, is detrimental to uh, democratic uh, to protecting a democratic institution. But it's also Islamophobia manifested in, in policing regime, you know, and profiling and all that. And that's also the surveillance torture and, and, and all the, the bad stuff. And that seen uh, across Asia Pacific, it takes different shapes and it depends about which uh, context we are talking about. But it's all trickle as Randa mentioned, you know, the, the war in terror provide the blueprint for that. And, and even if you move outside of the Asia Pacific, you can see it, for example, in some uh, African countries. So it became, it became that's how being weaponized. And, and in doing so, all, all the, 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 the wonderful talk about, you know, expanding democratic norms of, of civil society, it became less and less actually available to citizens who are not Muslims, you know, for all non-Muslim citizens in those nations their own uh, 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 rights became uh, in question. And, and I don't want me to remind you of uh, the Filipino journalist or uh, the Indian scholars that they face tremendous uh, scrutiny just because of they speak of against certain violence. Uh, they will be taken to court, they will be like uh, uh, threatened. Uh, and that's across the board, you know. Uh, so you can't touch anything but not touching those issues. Uh, and for me, that's how Islamophobia really became a ripe weapon uh, for anti-democratic forces, for the right wing. They can work actually across even locations. And that's the reason why winning of one Islamophobes in this particular part of the world, helping others. And you see that concerted uh, effort and relationships. But for me, as a researcher, I always wonder uh, it bugged me the question that Aranda bars to us, like this uh, contradictions. What's the role of Muslim majority countries? What is it that in the name of economic relationships or economic interest, you will are willing to sacrifice um, the extension of those population or just in sta to stand up for, for, for equity and, and equal treatment across the board, you know, if you're going to protect... Uh, other religious minority within uh, Muslim majority countries. So how that would play out, you know? So it's very, it's very interesting and it shows that uh, the global politics actually being crippled by the war in terror, being crippled by the collapse of governance, being crippled by uh, the larger failure of uh, neoliberal uh, 
uh, economic relationships. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Sadek um, and Dr. Itawi for your comments and for sharing the high level findings and analysis on Islamophobia in the Asia Pacific region. I'd now like to turn to Europe to bring our attention to contextualize the phenomenon of Islamophobia in Europe and to hear from the authors of the European Reading Resource Pack. And I'm going to ask that we keep our, our responses to five minutes just so we can um, manage our time for, for our remaining time together. And my first question is for Dr. Huyaki, and I'd like for you to walk us through how is race and whiteness connected to Islamophobia in the European context? Um, very difficult question to answer, of course, in five minutes, but I will try to give a couple of insights. Um, readers will notice when they are looking at the um, a reading resource pack that these keywords race and um, racism of course also they um, pop up every now and then throughout the different categories that we have also um, covered just as um, Rhonda just listed the categories we actually have quite similar ones I think if not all the same um, and whiteness in in general of course um, is something very sensitive to the European, the European identity. Um, Islam generally in Europe, um, most probably also in other parts um, of the world, is, is perceived as the religion of any, anybody else but not ours. So it's, it's perceived as an immigrant religion, it's not perceived as um, something that belongs to Europe or it's not perceived as a, as a white religion because the Europe generally it has been relying heavily on this narrative of of, um, of course Christian identity then there is this connection that has been you know brought up with the Judeo-Christian heritage of course in, in the aftermath of the Holocaust also kind of like <laughs> um, reconciliating the the damage that was done um, by those atrocities um, but um, the thing is this that um, you can approach approach the whiteness or or race and Islamophobia, all of these things and their intersections, you can you can approach it from different perspectives. Um, one would be white supremacy, for instance, which um, also was mentioned by, by Rhonda in the um, example of the um, Christchurch massacre. Um, the shooter actually, he had also ideological connections to um, European history where Bosniak Muslims were slaughtered by um, uh, Serbs, local Serbs, but also others, um, and solely based on the fact that, um, you know, they were Muslims. I mean, here where I am currently residing in Bosnia and Herzegovina, obviously, um, the thing is that there was the phenotype, whiteness as a phenotype would not have made any difference. It was just about the fact that um, one's religious affiliation literally made the other person and the other that had to be dealt with and it was problematized and so on and so forth. So this, um, let's say, um, second shame of the European recent history after the Holocaust, I would say, um, was also connected to, um, it is largely connected to um, worldwide white supremacy. It's just like El Sadiq also mentioned that the white uh, right wing um, politics, the, 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 the groups, the movements, they are already operating transnationally and they have these connections, right? So um, whiteness and race and Islamophobia, or if you want to call it anti muslim racism, which is also very much acceptable and myself, I actually prefer it rather more, more like that. Um, it is connected to this national belonging, national identity, you know? Um, and myself, I have um, studied um, Muslim converts, and here it's very interesting how, for instance, they, upon um, um, becoming Muslims, they um, are said to lose their whiteness, so to say. We do also have these articles in the in the uh, reading resource pack by by other researchers as well who are tackling this issue of how it is that a person. 
um, can become so much racialized only because of this change of, of religion and identity, and especially when it's visible, you know, because at the same time, when um, a person, um, let's say, for instance, myself, if I wouldn't be wearing the headscarf, many people wouldn't be able to even um, assume that I am a Muslim, right? But with the headscarf, I make my religious affiliation very visible, and then I become um, vulnerable, and I am victimized, and I am otherized. So um, I think that it is um, fundamentally we are talking about this kind of like an attempt of of um, attempt sort of like a struggle for for let's say survival in terms of um, um, ethnic survival, which is absolutely of course something that. Um, cannot be um, justified and it's, it's not even, um, let's say, reasonable. Um, I think um, in terms of um, theories such as create, replace, and, and such, immigrants and Muslims replacing the European native um, nations, um, it is just fear-mongering. And um, at the end of the day, the question is only, um, uh, what is all fuss about, of course, for us as researchers and, and people orienting, um, you know, towards diversity and inclusion. Um, for us, it's, of course, very unreasonable. But for many others, it just seems to be that um, it is easy to always um, blame the other and look for the scapegoats um, somewhere else than in your own team, so to say. Um, I hope I was keeping within the time for this one. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Huyaki. I'm going to jump into my final question for this round for Dr. Hafiz. Um, and I'll ask you two questions, but if, if we need to spill over into uh, the Q&A or closing remarks, we can, we can accommodate that. So the first part is, what are the uh, specificities of Islamophobia in various European countries? And you mentioned um, in your previous comments the reluctance of European institutions to recognize Islamophobia. And so I'm curious, what are the current challenges of fighting Islamophobia in Europe today? And you have five minutes. All right. <laughs> I'll try to keep it short and spicy. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, um, I think one interesting aspect is obviously, and you will see that in the literature, that there is more focus uh, rather on Western Europe, because this is unfortunately also where you have much, much more, uh, quantitatively speaking, much more um, um, research in English language. Um, but uh, if you look at the east of Europe, um, obviously, when we had the influx of a lot of refugees coming from Syria and Iraq back in 2014-15. Uh, there was an enormous increase of Islamophobia in the political stage, right? Uh, which it can be contrasted to the fact that there are nearly no Muslims living there. I mean, we have like uh, in, in a lot of uh, Eastern European countries, like let's say Hungary, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, etc., those are countries with uh, some of them 0, 0.0 something percentage of the whole population is Muslim. So we have this idea of is strong Islamophobia, though some of the countries with most Islamophobia, because it was so much pushed in the, in the public arena by the pol politicians who are in power, not the opposition, right? Not the far right opposition, but often uh, authoritarian like, you know, uh, politicians in power. Um, also, what El Sadiq uh, spoke about, we should never forget that we have countries in Europe that have not only Muslim minorities, but large minorities, like native minorities, if we speak about Linda, uh, uh, Bosnia, where Linda is residing, or if we speak about other countries um, like France or Austria, where nearly a bit less than 10% of the whole population, meanwhile, has been become Muslim, right? Um, so, especially in those uh, interesting contexts where you have native Muslim populations like Albania, Kosovo, uh, uh, Bosnia, um, or even the Pomaks in Bulgaria and, and, my, and minorities in Romania, um, 
the whole uh, dynamics of how Islamophobia wor uh, works and plays out is quite different to what we see in Western Europe. So we also tried to our utmost with that scholarship that is available in English to include that. Um, and um, and then there are uh, some good works here. Um, the other thing is um, uh, in, in terms of your second question, so to come just to come to my end, um, the reluctance that we see on behalf of a lot of European uh, institutions to recognize is even has grown much worse. Um, I, I would say, you know, Europe is not Europe. So we have different countries who have different strategies, even those 27 countries who are united in the European Union. Um, they may differ a lot when it comes to the treatment of their Muslim minorities. But, and this is a big but, um, the, the, the issue and, and, and the challenge at the moment is that you have very strong countries who are at the forefront of those who are institutionalizing Islamophobia, like, for instance, France. And they are doing everything uh, to not only uh, have these Islamophobia, uh, institutionalized forms of Islamophobia, uh, materializing in France, but really to export it to the rest of Europe. So I would say there is currently really a struggle on a European uh, supranational level of how different nation states try to convince the others what to do. And unfortunately, I would argue there is a tendency of those who are very hostile to export their understanding of how they should treat Muslims. And um, in, 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 the, in the last, I mean, some of you who might have been following what is going on in France, and this is getting more attention, especially in the US media, um, like the New York Times and others, there is this idea of Islamophobia that I would say plays out in three different ways. First of all, it is basically um, the, the attempt to extinguish any kind of Muslim visibility. To give one example, this uh, recent abaya ban for st students in school, in public schools in France. Um, the other aspect of Islamophobia is the attempt to basically withdraw the right for Muslims to organize themselves in associations similar to other citizens and to other people or, or the population. And we have seen that in the cr huge crackdown that happened uh, with the uh, Macron government a couple of times, also in Austria and, and other countries. And the third aspect is, um, and I think that speaks very much to, uh, and the first two aspects too, but the third aspect speaks especially to what El Sadiq has been saying, the shrinking of civil society, even to the extent that every sort of, of resistance to that uh, uh, attempt to shrink civil society space and to, um, I I to implement more and more authoritarian measures, even that sort of resistance is being criminalized. Um, you know, we had the largest watchdog in France, uh, the, Islamophobia, uh, the collective of Islamophobia uh, in France being closed because the Ministry of Interior was saying whoever speaks about Islamophobia is, uh, is uh, 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 um, supporting terrorism, right? And then they came with anti-terrorism legislation. Speaking again to what Rhonda has uh, mentioned in terms of how the global war on terror is, uh, is part and parcel of our understanding of contemporary Islamophobia. So there are challenges, there are pushbacks, but I would not say that, uh, you know, the current state of the art and, and, the, uh, and the future that we see um, um, in, in, in the couple, next couple of years might be too bright for, uh, for, for Muslim people. Thank you, Dr. Hafez. Thank you all for sharing your insight and critical analysis on Islamophobia in the global context and for drawing out how Islamophobia is being instrumentalized around the globe and for giving us a peek into this rich and much needed body of work. Um, I want to invite each of you to share some final thoughts and maybe for this um, two to three minutes so we can have time for hopefully one or two questions in the Q&A. 
And I'd like to invite Dr. Hafiz to, to start us off. So <laughs> if you have any connecting thoughts, feel free to jump in. Okay. Are we already like at, with the questions or? Uh, yeah. we're, we're wrapping up um, mm -hmm. kind of your, this is closing comments and then we'll have time for hopefully one or two questions from the audience. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to make it very short. So in, in order just to secure some time for the debate. Um, but yeah, um, I think altogether, uh, I'm very happy that beyond the uh, US uh, reading package on Islamophobia, we have now the one in Europe and the one in Asia and the Pacific, because I really think, um, you know, it shows a lot of, it will show and amplify more and more uh, to interested audience and the, and the wider readership that, uh, first of all, this is a global question, right? Um, as Linda said at the very beginning, some People assume that, you know, this is a majority minority issue in Western Hemisphere. No, it is not. It is global. It has implications on all of these different levels uh, into which we uh, um, um, uh, stru structured uh, our reading uh, resource package. So um, I, I hope that this will really be a, a huge contribution in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Huyaki, I'd like to invite you to share any closing remarks. Um, well, I mean, obviously, I second, of course, that what uh, Farid also said about the uh, hopes for this publication to be beneficial for as many stakeholders as possible. Um, but finally, um, I, I feel that um, it is time that this I hope for a time where we don't have a job anymore, where we don't have to research Islamophobia anymore. Uh, I'm sorry, my colleagues, but like that would be great. And we can maybe do something else like maybe mathematics or physics. I don't know. But I really do hope that there would be such a time. And because it's really getting frustrating um, just to trying to always, you know, as Muslims, especially when you're trying to explain to people that, um, you know, you are constantly pushed to justify yourself you're constantly being pushed to explain yourself etc and, and and fight for your own right to exist the way how you are and um especially this uh, conversation about race and racism and whiteness and even though i also said that you know it's always easier to see seek for blame in others than in your own team but it is time that we consider ourselves um, all of us as part of one team so this is um, actually the, the gist of, of, of belonging, that everybody can belong um, the way how they just are and, and contribute to the society with their um, specifics and, and attributes and, and wonderfulness. So that's my closing. Thank you. Saldik, I invite you to share any closing remarks that might help. Yeah, uh, being threatened by the time frame. Uh, but yeah, no, I definitely, uh, I see, uh, uh, and I agree with Linda, uh, I'm, I'm already sharpening my tools to move beyond Islamophobia, and I wish we never had to research that topic. But unfortunately, I, I will report back to say it's, it's impossible, because the structural conditions for weaponizing Islamophobia is going to exist if we win the fight against Islamophobia will be another form of of others. So I think, and, and that's my closing remark, I think it's a couple of, of thoughts. Uh, we, we need to think, uh, if we radically imagine the world we want to live in, in our future, we should ask the question, what it takes to get there? What is it it takes to get there? And I think one of the uh, things that we learn within the context of the United States is we have to build coalition across the board across all uh, uh, marginalized group. And second, and that's, it could be very prevalent in, in, in the context of Asia Pacific, but it's also unfortunately in Europe, like how Muslim being vilified, being, being slaughtered, and nobody actually come to the rescue. And what that will tell us uh, necessity that Muslims communities, you know, it, they need to learn from each other. So we need to foster a way in which to create a global containers 
for a scholarship, but also for civil society mobilizations. Uh, that's uh, to do the bridging between Muslims community and, and, and non-Muslim majority countries, but is also to strengthen the self-confidence of fighting back. Like how the French Republic with all its arrogance of, of secularism is actually just attacking Muslim to, uh, to appear to the wider uh, uh, right-wing uh, uh, potential voters. So I, I can't imagine what the future for France is, whether Macron or, or Le Pen win. What, what is the future by going down this rabbit hole? Uh, and what implications that will have, for example, in the Francophone world? And we've seen it already. Uh, people in, in, in certain Muslim uh, uh, majority or minority African countries that are Francophone, they despise the French because of what they do, because it's connected. They see that. Uh, so for me, uh, as a person who tried to work in uh, expanding belonging as a global norm and global currency, like I all constantly think about how we bridge. Not we bridge to the enemy, but how we bridge across our own even uh, 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 divinity, but affiliation, but not understanding each other um, uh, as a Muslim community across the globe. One, two, how to strengthen our civic engagement with each other, but it's also to assert our position as Muslims, that we are proud of who we are, regardless of what type of Islam is. I think those those kind of features are very important uh, in the fight against Islamophobia in a context like very vicious, like in Myanmar, for example. You know, can can we 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 try to break through to Myanmar or or China? Uh, but always always the signals come out of the West, with the leadership of United States and the European Union, it's so relentlessly and repackaged in a very kind of. Uh, a natural face value, but that's how we uh, those blesses being encouraged to do so in the name of national security, national cohesion, or protecting the cell phone terrorism. So I think it's a call for all of us to rethink a formation of the global uh, mobilization against Islamophobia, with the caveat that we need to be in that work with others, uh, qualified, marginalized. Uh, groups. We can't just pick and choose. If I want other people to be in solidarity with me, I have fairs to show up. Thank you. Thank you. And to close us out for this part, I invite Dr. Aitawi. Thank you. And um, thank you, Sadiq, Linda and Farid. I think I'll keep this very brief. I think you've covered um, most of what I might have mentioned as well. And what I'd like to say is I do hope that um, these reading packs provide a synthesis and an evidence base to propel some of that positive movement and work. Um, you know, what we have highlighted are the kind of the key interconnections. We've highlighted the unique kind of contexts of each nation. Um, and we've also, I think, you know, within our work really demonstrated how um, you know, how there are some particular ways of moving forward and how there are counter kind of narratives and strategies that are being adopted and the ways that we can continue to build on that. So I do hope that we've provided, you know, collectively through these annotated bibliographies and a, a lot of um, work that, you know, that went into that synthesis, the groundwork for some of that positive movement and, and you know, a, and a way to start the conversation in how to best take action moving forward. Thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing your closing remarks. Um, I believe we have some time for one or two questions from the audience to the panelists. And um, the first one that I believe we have is, what are some ways that Muslims and non-Muslims can build bridges and understanding? And it's open to whoever wants to to jump in. And I know Sadiq touched on some of that in your closing remarks, but if anyone else wants to comment, feel free. Yes. I think that a very good way is to just 
open and honest dialogue where it's not just about um, you know um, comparing, for instance, um, religious beliefs, but also kind of like actually seeking for a common ground. Um, I'm always a big fan of forming alliances for anything that we do, especially when it's um, in the fight for social justice. And I believe that when we find a common ground that we can stand on and then we that, and we can work towards for, we can also at the same time appreciate the differences that we bring into the conversation as different individuals coming from different backgrounds and see that it is actually that diversity actually is something that enriches us and doesn't bring us down. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Itell. Yeah, I'd like to just quickly add as well, um, based on my reading and an engagement with the literature, I think the power of um, digital platforms like social media as a counter narrative to mainstream media that usually perpetuates Islamophobia. So I think it's a double edged sword in some ways because um, social media has had a very powerful effect in building, I think, understanding and insight into the Muslim experience, like especially, for example, at TikTok with um, Ramadan and how it's provided people around the world with insight into what it might be, what it might be like for Muslims to fast Ramadan and, and building understanding around some of the Muslim practices and really humanizing uh, the faith based on the lived experience of Muslims. But then on the flip side, social media has been used as well to, um, to reinforce division and especially in particular contexts of Asia, incite violence uh, against Muslims. So I would signal like with caution that I think social media and alternative digital platforms have quite a, a powerful potential to contribute to building bridges and understanding, um, you know, with, with the caveat that it might also um, be used to, to, to really um, produce the opposite effect. Thank you. Any other comments? Otherwise, we can go to our second question. Oh, I saw you unmute, unmute Dr. Hafiz. Would you like to comment? No, I would jump on another question. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Let's do our second one, um, which is, do you think in the future India could be the main exporter of Islamophobia globally, thanks to the large Indian diaspora worldwide, its increased influence and social media's role in it all. And anyone is welcome to jump in. Yeah, um, very short take. Although I have not written the, the Asian part, but uh, I, I would rather like to touch upon this issue uh, from the perspective of, uh, the, of geopolitics, because um, looking at the Islamophobia studies literature, you will see that, you know, within the first maybe 15 years, there was a huge amount of, uh, especially reports from U.S. think tanks, but also um, other work that has highlighted um, the big money for the Islamophobia industry coming basically from those foundations and interest groups that are aligned uh, by the radical right in Israel, uh, presuming uh, that you know, any kind of Muslim agency would pose a long time threat for them if Muslims become stronger in the US. Um, so there has been a, a, a very strong concentration on this aspect. Now, with uh, the more recent uh, uh, developments, there has been now a strong uh, focus on the United Arab Emirates as one of the sponsors of uh, many of these Islamophobic policies in Europe and elsewhere. And obviously, uh, India has also become one of these big global players, not only mingling in issues like in Washington, D.C., where they're trying to uh, emphasize their, their position in regards also to um, some of the critics uh, from journalism and academia who are questioning uh, many other things that the Modi government is currently doing. But also, some of you might be aware of the statistics that argues that most Islamophobic tweets emerge from India, right? So um, there is, I think there is a geopolitical dimension 
um, to how Islamophobia plays out and in, especially in regards to the question of who finances all of that. So, yeah, um, I think this is something in general that we should keep in mind. And we should also not exclude other countries that might not be so much uh, in at the focus currently, like, let's say, for instance, China, which also has a very uh, clear agenda when it comes to um, its more Western territories in Xinjiang. And uh, uh, and even even uh, regional powers like Russia, for instance, um, in in their uh, in their attempt to stabilize their power, especially in the more southern regions where you have a lot of uh, Muslim populations. Um, so I think there is, the the geopolitical dimension to this question is a very, very crucial one that we should never overlook. And the more research we have there, the more information is out there, the better. Thank you so much. Thank you, audience, for your questions for the panelists. Oh, Sadek, would you? Yes, very quickly, would you like to jump in? Uh, yeah, I just want to add to that. I, I really would love for us to separate between uh, India diaspora and the state. Uh, I'm really not comfortable lump sum both of them as a bearer of Islamophobia. Uh, it could be individual because Islamophobia is really structural from what we've been seeing and doing. So the, the, the structure of elite class in India pushing for, for that for obvious political reasons. I, I, I hope and I think and I believe and I want to believe that diaspora could work actually oppose the expansion of Islamophobia in the diaspora. So uh, to answer the question, I do not think that because of the large India diaspora around the world, we will have an expansion of Islamophobia. Uh, I think the other way around, maybe this diaspora could work as a whip against the national uh, egoistic uh, neo-fascist uh, leadership in India and to double that, all the discriminatory aspects, including Islamophobia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your for your comments and taking those questions. And thank you, audience, for posing those questions to our panelists. Um, thank you, everyone, for this rich and thought-provoking conversation and discussion. I also want to extend appreciation to my colleague at the Other and Belonging Institute, Marka Bizade, for running the show behind the scenes. And thank you all in the audience for joining us today. And if if you'd like to rewatch or share this event, we will have it posted on the Othering and Belonging Institute website shortly. So thank you everyone again for joining. Thank you everybody. <laughs>